me kick off now. Uh, on behalf of the Council and the Secretariat uh, of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Council's pre-budget statement uh, ahead of Budget 2024. Uh, as I am sure everybody joining here is aware, the Council is an independent, uh, official independent body established under the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and our mandate revolves around four elements, endorsing and assessing the official macroeconomic forecasts, assessing official budgetary projections, monitoring compliance with fiscal rules, and assessing the government's overall fiscal stance. Our focus is on bro the broader fiscal perspective rather than an individual tax or individual spending measures. In our latest publication, pre-budget 2024 statement, we update the Council's analysis from the June 2023 Fiscal Assessment Report ahead of the budget, including the news contained in the summary economic statement and any economic news received since then. So, in terms of the macroeconomic context for the, uh, for the budget, uh, and despite the challenges of the last few years, the Irish economy is in an unusually strong position both historically and, and compared to other countries. It's now beyond full employment by our assessment. Overall unemployment is around 4%, a historical low, but in many sectors, especially such as construction, the labor market is even tighter. Wage and labor cost data suggests they're growing by about 5.1% and vacancy rates generally remain high. It is our assessment that this economy does not require additional stimulus through a large budgetary package. The tax returns over the last year have reflected this strong economy, though there are some signs of an abatement in the rate of growth. Data from the latest exchequer returns released yesterday show that income tax cumulatively is up 8.2% year on year, though only up 3.8% year on year for the month of August. Pure SI receipts are currently 5.7% ahead of profile for the year, but we're weak in August at 1.4% below profile for the month. But strong revenues should not be taken to mean a war chest of resources to distribute, just as weak revenues should not necessarily be interpreted as a risk to budget measures. These data must be interpreted beyond short-term developments. Moreover, spending overruns continue to grow. Current spending is now overrunning by 1.1 billion euro. Overruns in health and children are increasing. Health overruns now amount to around half a billion. And while some of the social protection and children uh, spending is likely driven by uh, spending on Ukrainian refugees and the earlier cost of living packages, for which there was some about 0.4 billion unallocated but earmarked for this spending, that, um, that money now appears to be exhausted given these overruns. The overruns now more than offset the current strength in revenue overall. This is especially true if we exclude corporate tax revenue. And as the most recent data has shown, there is huge uncertainty over about CT over the coming months, let alone over the coming years. A key message of the report is captured in this chart which evidences the historical relationship between measures of the output gap and changes in the structural primary balance. The, the predominance of diagonal entries from the upper left quadrant to the lower right quadrant indicate a general historical pattern of pro-cyclicality. A key message in our report is that the government should work to break with this pro-cyclical past but that does not seem to be the direction from the summer economic statement, which instead marked a significant change in policy from the SPU update. The government now plans to repeatedly breach the national spending rule every year out to 2026. This chart highlights that change in stance. Though there were still worries previously about some expenditure not budgeted for, the SPU 2023 plans indicated that the previous breach in the spending rule could genuinely be interpreted as a temporary support package with the path of coordinate spending returning to that 5% path indicated by the rule. This is not the case based on the summary economic statement. 
Core net spending is expected to be 4 billion higher by 2026 compared to these previous plans. And these breaches are serious. First, they risk repeating Ireland's past mistakes and would represent a continuation of pro-cyclical fiscal policy. Second, the stance adopted undermines the national spending rule at a time when EU fiscal rules are not binding and likely to be distorted by GDP if and when the new proposals are enacted. Finally, there is reason to be concerned about the manner in which the plans were revised. Such concerns weaken the credibility of government projections, they lack transparency, and still don't factor in overruns and costs related to population aging and the climate transition. The Council's advice to the government ahead of Budget 2024 is summarised in these three core bullet points. First, the government should stick to its national spending rule. Doing so would ensure a more credible and sustainable plans, if there is a desire for extra spending in certain areas, that can be achieved by offsetting tax increases or spending adjustment elsewhere. There is a need for tough choices. The government should also plan a comprehensive review of existing programmes to determine if there are programmes which they don't wish to continue to support. Second key advice, there is little to no justification for further temporary non-core measures. With energy prices falling, temporary measures, particularly if untargeted, risk adding to price pressures and would represent a further shift to a more cyclical, pro-cyclical fiscal policy. And finally, the government needs to improve its long-term planning. It's still the case that fiscal plans go, will go only to 2026. And as our recent research has shown, climate costs really start to mount from 2026 and ageing pressures, as we've shown in the long-term sustainability report, grow especially from 2030. Not taking this medium to longer run perspective into account limits the extent to which good planning can take place today. As an indication of the need for tough choices, consider the following chart, which shows our estimated standstill cost for next year, 2024. That is the cost of maintaining the value of current um, spending. We estimate that standstill would cost about 4.6 billion next year. Of course, the cost of standing still is higher when inflation is running higher and things cost more. This is a feature, not a bug of the national spending rule. Inflationary times are typically when the economy is running hotter and doesn't require extra fiscal stimulus. At such times, the rule affords less space and requires tougher choices. This helps avoid pro-cyclicality if the rule is adhered to. The chart also shows that in the summary economic statement, the government has allocated 4.3 billion to additional core current spending. This is almost enough to cover the costs of spending standing still, though of course we don't know exactly how that would be spent exactly across all, all, all packages. But at the same time, the government also decided to ramp up capital spending and has proposed tax pass packages worth around 1.1 billion. It seems like the tough choices are not being made. Moreover, the August exchequer returns highlight a key issue which we have stressed many times in the recent past. The ongoing reliance on corporate tax is risky given its volatility and potential, potential unreliability. While August has been a strong CT month recently, receipts were down about 1 billion, about 36% compared to 2022, though they are still high by historical standards. But this just highlights the unreliability of corporate tax receipts where one third is accounted for by just three groups. We have argued, and the government seems to have largely accepted the argument, that some of these CT returns should be treated as windfalls. Relying on volatile, volatile and concentrated revenue for permanent spending is a costly mistake that echoes the reliance on housing-related taxes before the financial crisis. This is not a mistake we should wish to repeat. As the chart on the left shows, we are far from certain about how much represents excess CT. And the concentration of this revenue means it's particularly susceptible to sectoral slowdowns 
or even simply the change in policies of a handful of large multinationals. Given this, we have welcomed the government's proposal for a savings vehicle. This could helpfully address the reliance on volatile tax revenues for permanent spending and would help to resist the temptation to spend money now and thus help break the pro-cyclicality of fiscal policy. Moreover, we can agree with the government and other commentators that there, a case can be made for additional public investment in areas such as housing, health, education, and possibly others. However, we are less convinced by the linking of these two ideas into a case for an investment vehicle. The National Development Plan provides a framework to plan longer term capital needs and existing plans already imply a ramp up to over 15 billion euros for capital spending in 2026, nearly double the 2019 levels. There are existing ways to achieve higher spending within the net national spending rule. This chart shows how under the old plans even, but especially under the revised plans, capital spending will be back to levels above 4% of GNI star and uh, uh, certainly by recent since the financial crisis at highs compared to the 2010 period on. But one concern about this is the timing of when you spend this money. Spending now risks low value for money, especially given that investment spending is typically concentrated in already constrained sectors. This chart shows worker shortages in construction and construction cost pressures, which have become particularly tight in terms of uh, supply and the costs have risen and the costs remain high relative to even just two or three years ago. The key thing to remember is it's not easy to catch up on years of lower investment quickly. It should be done carefully and in a well-planned manner. And this is what the National Development Plan aims to do. Finally, and perhaps unsurprisingly, given the concerns just expressed, we believe the Irish fiscal framework would benefit if the national spending rule was strengthened. Moreover, we encourage the government to design plans that will actually stick to this rule. The domestic fiscal rules are more important now that EU rules are not and likely won't again be binding for us. The domestic rules now represent the first line of defence. As I've already stressed, we should view the countercyclical aspect of the rule as a feature and not a bug. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and we are now available to answer any questions, should you have any.